Hey everybody, so this is going to be a demo on the second of the exercises we're going to cover, which is going to be a 2D uh, manipulation of, a, say in this case, cutouts on a 4x8 sheet. So this is something that you might actually uh, reasonably use Grasshopper for in a professional environment, where in this case we'd be designing a panel, um, a 4x8 sheet is a common panel size for both wood materials and metal. Um, that's going to be cut out either on a CNC or a laser cutter um, to create specific pole, hole patterns, um, say for a translucent or um, semi-transparent material, maybe a screen wall on a project or something like that. So you can see here I have um, a sort of already a baked rhino example and a grasshopper example here. Um, and this thing is a live grasshopper. So if I move points around, it's going to take a second to calculate because it's all the way done. But you can see my uh, screen essentially adapts to the points that I have here and I'm going to show you how to make this um, step by step starting at the very beginning so I'm now going to take all the steps that I did to get here and I'm going to disable them and we'll start over so the first thing you're going to need is you're going to need a rectangle so for this rectangle we're just going to start we're going to make a four byte sheet so currently my units, and you can check your units, and this is the units in Rhino, not Grasshopper. Whatever units you're using in Rhino or the units you're using in Grasshopper are set to inches uh, with feet and inches, although that doesn't really matter. Just make sure you're set to inches. I'm now gonna draw out a rectangle that is um, set at the zero, zero point. In order to do this, I'm just gonna make sure my grid snap is on and it'll allow me to snap to my zero, zero. So I wanna do four feet by eight feet. And oops, eight feet. Um, I also am going to need three points. So just uh, to create a point, you can press this button here. You right click, you'll be able to make multiple points. Left click will create a single point. So you can just kind of scatter these around. Um, you only need three. Um, you could do more. It doesn't actually change the complexity, but for this assignment, you only need three. Uh, so what we need to do is load all these things into Rhino. So we're going to start off by first loading in the points. So I'm going to type in point. And again, I double click to do that and then type in point and it'll give me this empty uh, module here, which I'm going to now right click and do set multiple points. And then select all three of those points by uh, dragging a rectangle across them and hit enter. So you can now see three points are set. If I hold my mouse over this, you can see three locally defined values, reference point, reference point, reference point. Next thing I need to do is get the curve, and that's going to be for that uh, rectangle there. So set one curve, and again, I just right click to do that, go down to set one curve, and then select that curve. So uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to create a grid that those points are going to be on. So I'm going to go to, uh, where are grids? I believe they're under vector. So I'm going to create a hexagonal grid. We could do a rectangular grid as well, but a hexagonal grid is going to allow for better spacing of our circles. Essentially, if you use a hexagonal grid versus a rectangular grid, a rectangular grid will align um, all the circles straight up and down with each other, whereas a hexagonal grid shifts the list or shifts, shifts each row, which allows them to fit more closely next to each other. It packs them in tighter. Um, so we're going to go with this as our um, grid option. So we're going to need a few different sliders in order to control this. So I'm just going to type 11 and create a couple 0 to 100 sliders. Again, anytime I type 11 into the keyword, just by double clicking and hitting 11, it's going to create a slider to go from 0 to 100. Any value between 11 and 99 will do that. If you type in 100, it'll go actually 0 to 100 as well. Uh, but if you were to do 101, it will do 0 to 1000. And these are just sort of standard presets. So I want to make um, a grid where each of these hexagons is two inches. So the first slider here, or the first one here is asking for a plane. We're going to leave that blank because it's going to use the default uh, XY plane of your model, which is the same plane that we're working with here. You can see that's where it is. The next is the size. So that's the size of the each side of the hexagon. So I'm going to set that to be two inches. So any number here, numerical value. And the next is the uh, X extent and the Y extent. So we're just going to plug these values in. And you can see that it's going to start creating a hex grid. 
So if I want it to be, ultimately I need it to basically be one less than filling uh, the full length here. So if I were to go to 28, you can see it goes ever so slightly over where if I do 27, yep, it's slightly under. Same thing we want for the side. And you'll see why um, it's because it's not perfectly centered on this thing right now, but that's okay. We'll deal with that in a little bit. Um, so basically what that's done is it gives us these hexagons, which the output here is what are called cells and what are called points. The cell in this case is the uh, six sides as a curve of each one of these hexagons, which means that right there, uh, we actually have two different curves. We have the curve from this hexagon and the curve from this hexagon, which means we end up with a lot of lines going on in one place. Uh, but ultimately we want the points. So I'm gonna type in point. And this is an unnecessary step, but it just allows you to see, so we can see the points. They are at the center of each one of the hexagons. Now we're going to, we wanna start creating some circles. So I'm gonna type in circle. And that wasn't right. Circle, there we go. We wanna do what's called circle C and R. I'm just hit enter. And that is the center, the normal, which is the direction of the circle, which again, we'll leave as the default because that will be the Z axis um, directly up. And then the radius of that circle is what we'll set next. So we're gonna put in a little slider. Let's do, let's say two. And now we can see we've created a series of circles. Now, because our grid size, hex size is two and our circle size is two, we get this sort of nicely matched up pattern. And actually we can see them all together and we can see that everything's kind of perfect. This isn't ultimately the size of circles we want. This is just kind of a first step. Uh, Cause really what we wanna be able to do is make the circles larger or smaller depending on their relationship to these uh, three points here. In order to do that, we need to make, uh, take these points and we need to make a comparison between their location and the location of the points that I have loaded in. So here are my three points. Um, and the easiest way to do that is we need to uh, compare the distances. So I'm gonna type in a command distance, which will I will put in the grid values in the top. And I'm going to, nope. so there's a cells, so that's not what I wanted. I wanted the grid values. And I'm actually going to uh, flatten this output here. The reason being, uh, it tries to organize it by rows and we don't really need that. So we're just going to flatten it. Um, so it's just a whole bunch of points now, not organized in any sort of uh, internal organization. And now we wanna put in the points. So what this will give us, and if we type in panel, is for each one of those points, and again, these points here, we are now given a list. So I'm gonna make this smaller so we can see it easier. Um, too many points in that list. So now my hexagon is just five by five. So we should have in total 25 points, much easier list to see. Um, now the problem that we're having here is that we're only getting 25 points when really we wanna have uh, 75 points at this point. Um, and so we have zero to 24. So 24 is not 25, but since we're starting with zero and not one, um, that's why this is 25 values, even though it says 24 right there. Always a little confusing, uh, but just that's the sort of uh, language that it tends to work in. Um, so we have three points in here, but because this is ungrafted data compared to ungrafted data, Grasshopper is just gonna compare them directly. So the first value on the points list is going to be compared to the first value on this point list, which is one of our reference points. The second value here will be compared to the second value here. And the third value here will be compared to the third value here. And everything beyond the third value will still use that third value. So even though we have 24, uh, 25 points in here, most of which are only going to be compared to that last reference value. So we actually need to create multiple lists. So I'm actually going to graft, I'll graft it here. So you can graft on either end. So if I graphed here, we get to see that line, which is helpful. Anytime you see the dashes, that means it's grafted data. So now instead of one list with three points in it, we have a list that has three lists, each one with one point in it. So when we get our output here, we're gonna have three lists. Each one has 25 values. And 
this is close to what we want, but it's not exactly what we want. Because what we want to know is for each one of these points, we want to know which circle is closest to us and how far away that distance is. Um, and this doesn't exactly get us that. What we need to do is what's called a flip matrix. Again, this is kind of a technical thing, but you don't have to fully understand it to get it to work. And I'm just explaining it because I think it's helpful um, if you can sort of start to grasp this. Grafting data in Grasshopper is incredibly complex to understand, and I can only understand it partially the way, and it's taken me years to really get a grasp of what's actually happening. Uh, but by flipping the data, instead of having three lists, each list having 25 values in it, I now have 25 lists with each list having three values in it. So essentially, each one of the grid points, each one of these, now has a list of distances to the three different points that we have. And that's what these three values are. Uh, but we, what we really want to know is we want to know the lowest value. So I'm going to do a command called sort, which is just going to, and I'm going to copy this guy so we can see in comparison. It'll take the same data, but instead of it being 36, 83, 55, it's now 36, 55, 83. The lowest value will always be the first value on each list, each of these sublists, I should say. So now we can just select the lowest, that first item, which I'm going to do a Sorry, I went too quickly there, but the it's called list item, and that will take, uh, essentially you put in a list, which will you a sorted list. It will take the first index item, which is that first one, and set to zero. So we could set this to be any integer, and it will give us that value. So because we have it set to zero, it's gonna take the smallest value, which is the one we want. So we could just directly plug this in as a radius, and now it looks a little crazy. Let's make this bigger so we can see. Uh, partly the reason it's crazy is because we are plugging in uh, non-grafted data with grafted data, which in general, that should be a red flag for you. If you see that happening, probably something is wrong. They usually, in most cases, you want to be plugging grafted data with grafted data and non-grafted data with non-grafted data. Not always, but usually. Again, lots of rules of thumb, not necessarily um, exact things. Um, so we actually want to flatten this guy. So we're going to flatten it. So now we're comparing 702 values versus 702 values. Both flattened data, that's exactly what we want. So that will only create a total of 702 circles. You can see here, they are crazy big, not exactly what we're looking for, but at least they are being influenced by the placement of these points, and that's changing their size. Uh, but now what we want to do is we want to sort of change the relationship. So basically we can make that sort of smooth fall off as the closer they are uh, to the points, uh, the more it affects it and not have these crazy high values. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, pull up three modules. And again, these are going to be kind of technical. You don't fully need to understand what's going on here. But if you do follow along, you should be able to create the exact same thing. And I'll try to explain the best I can is actually what's happening. Um, I'm just going to type these in real quick. So we're going to need something called bounds, which looks like this. It has a min and a max on it, and it says bounds. Uh, so we're going to need that. We're going to need a uh, construct domain that looks like this. So it has a zero and a one and a little line, and it says construct domain. It does not have a two at the end. It only says construct domain. And finally, we're gonna need something called remap numbers, which is exactly that, remap numbers. So what this is gonna do is basically, uh, let's take a little panel here. And again, I'm gonna shrink this down so we have less values to work with, only so that we can sort of see them all at once and so as opposed to uh, having 700 values, we'll be able to keep that down to a nice 25. So these distances are essentially the distances on um, the closest point to each one of the points in our grid. Um, however, these values are rather high. So if we plug these in as a radius right now, it makes for very large circles. It would be great is if instead of it being from whatever, so if we actually plug this into bounds, we'll actually know. So our lowest value right now is 21, our highest value is 39. It'd be great if instead of that, our lowest value was zero and our highest value were one. 
um, because then we would have a much easier range to work with than we could use as a multiplier for our set radius. And that's what remap is going to do. It's going to take all this data and remap it. So instead of it being between those original bounds, it's going to be between whatever bounds we set. So <clears throat> in order to do that, we have to take the data, the stream here, which is a smooth stream. So we know it is ungrafted data. We need the bounds. We'll plug that into the S value because that's what it's looking for. The source uh, domain, and the domain is really just the sort of high and low value in this case. Uh, the values which are going in here, and we need to set our domain. So we're going to plug this in. Now, I believe this might have something set by default, but we're going to set up uh, some sliders. So I'm going to type in 0.1, and that's going to create a slider. Oops, actually, no, not going to do that. We want a slider that is rational numbers that goes between uh, 0 and 1. So uh, I could have typed in 0.5, and that would bring that up pretty easily for me. I'm going to plug, make two of these, so they're exactly the same thing. Plug one into A and the other into B. So now our data will go from zero to one, and that's our target. So now if we look at this panel, we should have the same number of values, but they go from, they're not ordered in any particular order right now. Um, we could sort them to do that. We could also just use the same bounds command and see what our bounds are. It should be 0 to 1. So what we're going to do is do a multiplication, which I'm just going to type in multiplication, and multiply this value from 0 to 1. And now I'm going to do, I need a radius, so I want my target radius, um, let's say 2. And I'm going to edit this guy right away and set it to rational number so I can have smooth editing between 0 and 10. And again, the way you do that is right click and go down to edit. Just click on it. So essentially I'm multiplying a value between 0 and 1 times whatever radius I want. I pull this circle generator out and plug the radius in here. So now See here is my grid is rather small, so I'm gonna expand it again. I think I need this to be, so as I said, it's slightly lar smaller than the overall size that I need. So I think 16, I believe this one was 27 to get it to fit. 27, just ever so slightly smaller than the panel itself, which is fine. But you can see here, we already have set up this relationship where uh, the grid size is being affected by the points. So if I move a point around, it moves the grid. Problem is right now, the closer it is to the point, the smaller the uh, circles being uh, is ending up. And that's not exactly what I was going for. So to fix this, I'm actually just going to flip my domain. So instead of remapping the highest value to the lowest value, I'm now going to remap the lowest value to the highest value. I think I said that right. But if I flip these, you can just sort of instantly see what happens. And actually, I'm going to not set it to be the lowest value as uh, zero, I'm actually going to set it to be 0.1. That way I still have a circle and it doesn't just entirely disappear. So now we have the basic relationship set up. See as I move the points around, whatever circle is nearest that point increases in size. Of course I can change the radius so I can make them way too big and unnecessarily small, whatever it may be. And again, this is going to be different for each of you, but just pick a number that seems good to you. Um, so the next thing I want to do is I would rather, you can see here how there's not really a dramatic change between the largest circle and the smallest. I'd rather that be a little bit different. So I'm going to type in something called graph mapper, which again, just double click and then type in graph until you get a graph mapper. Plug, um, I want to take the values, so not the values before the multiplication, the values that are coming out of my remapping. So these values are between 0 and 1, and plug them into the graph mapper, and then plug that into the multiplication. Now initially that's not going to do anything, but if I right click on this graph mapper and select a graph type, and I'm going to go to a power, and essentially what it's going to do is, if I start dragging this around, you can see that the lower and more dramatic I make this, the more there is a sort of fall off from the biggest curve to the smallest curve. And if I do the opposite, essentially I can make that all go away so they're all the same size. But you can see here, I can kind of pretty precisely control how quickly I want those circles to taper off into a smaller size. Um, 
And since, of course, this is Grasshopper, I could come back and decide, oh, maybe I want my whole grid to be smaller, and I want more of them and more. So I could do a pattern that's kind of crazy, something like that. Uh, let's take that back. So again, I'm just trying to make it one smaller. Um, now you can see here my circles are too big, so they're overlapping. So I would need to go back, and um, all I have to do is adjust the final radius until I get it to just to the point where the circles are no longer touching, something like that. So now you can see here, I have a bunch of cutout circles. Now I'm actually not going to do that. I think the size two um, is a good compromise size. And again, this will need to be 16 at size two, and this will need to be 27. I was just showing for the sake of demonstration what that would look like if you started changing that grid. And of course my radius will need to be bigger so that I can make them nearly touch. So this, you know, if we were to cut this out of a panel good, you can see here that there's a good amount of material running through the circle. So this wouldn't be too weak. Every circle would be cut out so we could see through that pattern. And of course, being grasshopper, we can move these things around and change this. Now we could have put in more points. So we could have as many points as we want. So I could drag in another point here. Now it's not loaded into grasshopper yet, but I could put it in. Maybe put another point because it really doesn't matter. This little script we wrote will take in as many points as we put in. So I could do set multiple points, and now you can see they're all being taken into account. Um, and it really doesn't actually change how fast this thing runs. It will be essentially equal regardless. So the next thing we need to do once we're happy with the pattern is we want to sort of create a three-dimensional object, not just this sort of series of curves. So I'm going to type in boundary and come up with boundary surface. Um, now, if you recall, we made that original curve that is the outside box of this thing. So I'm gonna bring that forward because I need that guy now. Um, but the first thing I wanna do is, you can see here that my circles are kind of, oops, overlapping the edge here. And that's because I didn't quite center the grid. So the easiest way I'm gonna just handle this is just by moving my little box down one inch over and one inch um, in each direction. Um, and that should fairly well center things. It looks like maybe if I did maybe another half inch, the circles would be pretty perfectly centered. And I probably have to do the same thing for the height. So that was an inch and a half over, an inch half down. Um, so now everything fits inside my rectangle. So I'm going to take my circles into the boundary. And it will now create the circles into little surfaces. And if I plug the curve in, that is the outside uh, boundary of that uh, four by eight sheet, it will now use it and cut the circles out and we can see what's happening. Now you may see right here that I have a little thing that's indicating 1.4 S and that's 1.4 seconds. So that's how long this thing is taking to calculate. If you wanna see that on yours, that is a canvas widget that's right here. So you go to display, canvas widget, profiler, um, it's useful, especially as you start developing um, your own grasshopper definitions to be able to reference this and see where is it taking a lot of time, especially as things start to slow down. Um, so as you make adjustments now, it's not going to be nearly as fast. So, you know, when we were just adjusting the circles, it was pretty instantaneous. But now that we have this, you can see there's a bit of a delay every time I move one of these points. And that's always going to happen. Um, when you start doing commands like this, they're a little bit more complicated. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a extrude, um, which is looking for both geometry, which will be the surface, but it's also looking for a direction. So we know we want it to extrude upwards, which is the Z direction. So just type in Z. And now we need to set a distance. So I'm gonna set it to say a quarter inch, so 0.25, get a slider for that. And now we will have a three dimensional object. And again, we can still manipulate things. It will be slower now because we've not only got this 1.4 seconds that it takes to calculate, but also these point, uh, well, 253 milliseconds. So as I move things, it'll do it, but it'll take a second. Um, so that's kind of the, the beauty of Grasshopper is being able to sort of continue adjusting these things. If I wanted to, you know, play around more if that a pattern, I could uh, disable these so they're not calculating anymore. And that way, 
as I move things around, again, you'll see that it's quite fast again um, because it doesn't have to do that heavy calculation of actually making a boundary surface. The other thing I could do is I could decide that maybe I don't want to use this particular curve. So I found the other one that's kind of nice is the sine curve. Oh, maybe not that one. Uh, that was the wrong sine curve. That was this, um, not the sine curve. The sine curve is this one. If I drag this guy back, essentially you can see what's happening on this left side of the screen. I'm going to go to a top view because I think it'll be a little easier to see. But essentially, as I drag this thing, it's now going from sort of large to small to large to small to large to small and creating these interesting wave patterns that are happening. This might be better if you were using a smaller circle size, but in this larger circle size, it's kind of the pattern's getting lost and it's starting making me see dots, honestly. Um, so that one could be nice. Again, you're just sort of manipulating uh, this grid, which manipulates the overall sort of pattern you're creating. So conal, uh, power is the one I was using before, and that's the one that gives you that nice sort of consistent fall off between the highest value and the lowest value. So that's the one I'll stick with. So what you might use this for is say a screening element on a project where maybe you want more transparency above to let light in, maybe say because there's less privacy up above for a bathroom, for example, and below you want more privacy. So you don't want to have the circles really um, show up very much. So you can see here, they're getting real small. In fact, they are probably getting so small that they're kind of useless at that point, but you know, that's okay for this. If we were cutting this out in real life, I would probably eliminate the smallest circles because no laser cutter is gonna be able to cut that and there's no point in even trying. It's just so small. But for this assignment, this will be plenty. So again, you only need three points. I did five just to show you, but three is plenty and it doesn't really, it's not really any more complicated regardless of how you do it. So once you are happy with this, I'm going to enable these again. It'll take that 1.4 seconds to calculate. Now, this is not a real object in Rhino yet. It is an object in Grasshopper, so I can't do anything within a Rhino. If I were to try to render this, it wouldn't render. If I were to try to do any sort of command to this or build with it, it's not real. In order to make something real from Grasshopper, I have to go to the bake command, which I just right click on whatever I want to bake, which in this case is the last thing I did, the extrusion. Hit bake. Now you can Group things if you want, which sometimes is helpful, but this is all one surface, so it won't matter. Select the layer you want it to go on. I'm just gonna do default. And you can see here, I now have my baked geometry. I'm gonna turn off my ISO curve so I don't have to see it anymore. Um, now this is detached from Grasshopper. So if I move these points around, the pattern here is gonna update, but the pattern on the uh, on the right side will not. It's baked, it is set in stone, and that's what is gonna remain. So if I do this, you can see these patterns are updating. That one is not. So once you've done this, bake one off and get a view where you can see both the sort of grasshopper script and the baked version. And then uh, zoom in just to this particular definition. Now I'm gonna pull this a little closer so that I can sort of make this a little bit easier to see. Just do some nice little organizing. Um, and this is so that you can make this sort of submission for this. But once you can sort of kind of nicely see all the components, like so, then you just wanna take a screenshot of this. Well, make sure it's enabled, so we should be able to see that on the left. Take a screenshot and you're done with this portion of the assignment. Um, so next up will be uh, the skyscraper portion, which is actually, in a way, actually simpler than this guy, even though it's creating a whole three-dimensional multi-story skyscraper. Um, it's a sort of simple operation, but I think it's good to sort of see different types of things you can create. So both a sort of very small 2D panel project and then a very large multi-story skyscraper. All right, until the next one.